dear viewers, wherever you are, hello and welcome to this new episode of your program, Out of the Box. Last time, we talked about the School of Athens. That witnessed the inception of philosophy. And we talked about the very prominent student of the School of Athens, Plato, the student of Socrates. We talked about how he viewed life, how he viewed that there is a superior world of ideals or forms, and under that is a world of concepts, then images, until we reach the physical, tangible world. He also uh, talked to us about a very useful um, example, which is the allegory of the cave. And he described to us how can we leave that cave and what are the consequences of that. Today, we're still with Plato. But this time, we're talking about the political views of Plato. How does he view a uh, human polity? And again, uh, polity, politics, polis, police, actually, again, just like philosophia is a Greek word that is, became philosophy in English, love of wisdom. Again, politics comes from polis, which is like a city or a formation. It, is, it comes from... Greek as well. Um, to discuss this topic and discuss in further details the view of Plato, I'm really delighted tonight to be accompanied by Imad Adli Versum, who is a prominent writer and a freelance journalist. Imad, thank you very much for being with us tonight. Thank you, Mohammed. I'm very pleased and honored to be with you today. Um, the honor is all mine and uh, really looking forward to this discussion. But before we start the discussion, let's watch with our dear viewers a short report that sheds light on the basic stuff that Plato talked about in his most famous book, The Republic. The Republic of Plato is the premier and first book in political philosophy. Plato believes that democracy in an ignorant society with little knowledge and awareness always leads to a catastrophe, where the objective vision of governance is absent and chaos and conflicts prevail, which may ultimately lead to resort to strong dictatorial rule in search for safety and stability. Therefore, democracy is only suitable in an educated and enlightened society with a clear vision and goals. The ideal system for Plato is the aristocratic state based on the rule of merit not the powerful minority that monopolizes the good for itself or the anarchist majority. This ideal system is ruled by a philosopher king, and thus it's grounded in wisdom and reason. The aristocratic state that Plato considered to be the ideal state consisted of three classes. First, the ruling class, made up of the philosopher king, who has been identified as someone who possesses a spirit of gold. Second, assistance to the ruling class, which is made up of soldiers who possess silver souls, and their job is to defend the state and to impose the order that philosophers have placed on the majority. The first two classes of philosopher rulers and soldiers are forbidden from acquiring any private property in order to prevent the policies they establish from being distorted by their personal interests. The third class is the majority of the people who possess spirits of bronze or iron, who, unlike the first two classes, are allowed to own property and produce goods for themselves and for others. 
Specialization ensures that these classes remain in constant relationships of power and influence. Rulers control the city and set its laws and goals. The warriors carry out the orders of the rulers and the producers produce goods while being kept out of political affairs. Plato says that only the philosopher king is allowed to rule because he alone is capable of realizing the needs of all social classes and that he is a person who is controlled by reason and justice and not power or desire. In this ideal aristocratic system, there is a rigorous educational system designed to train intellectuals who are selfless and upright and whose souls have been pacified. This educational system produces people who are aware of the ultimate good through learning the truth on the basis of platonic ideas. Each individual is given the maximum level of education according to his abilities and not to his social background. Because the philosopher's son may have limited capabilities, while the worker's son might be a genius. Therefore, it is not fair for the philosopher's son with limited capabilities to be honored and given more than he deserves just because of his father's history. And it's not fair as well for the son of the intelligent worker to be given less than he deserves just because his father was a worker. Dear viewers, after watching the report that shed light on the Republic, we're back again with the discussion about the Republic of Plato. Uh, first and, and foremost, before we go into any details, Ivan, um, to what extent do you agree with the general analysis of Plato? He talked about a society that is made of three levels. So we have the philosopher king or ruler, then we have the guardians or the guards, the military, and under that we have um, the commoners or the workers. Uh, to what extent do you agree with this hierarchy? And again, we're not going to depth yet, just a yes. general I idea. Understand. Yes, of course. Well, first of all, uh, what Plato uh, stated in his hierarchy is not something that was unique for his ideas because this kind of hierarchy existed already or at that time uh, in the Egyptian um, uh, state, at that time the ancient Egyptian state, where they had three levels as well of uh, people or system. They had the pharaoh on the top, and uh, after that they had the priest of the temples, his army, and the philosophers, and at the bottom were everybody else. So the, the idea itself is not unique. I assume that maybe he took it from the neighbor country at that time, which Egypt, and the, but he uh, designed it in a different way to serve his theory of the Republic, which is ideal theory in itself. So first we said it's not a new idea as I see it. And second, uh, it is a very ideal theory or ideal thought. Sometimes I see it as too good to be true. Okay. Because it, sorry, <laughs> yeah, it's too good to be also. true. Yeah, you're saying. yeah. So it, as, as many things are too good to be true. Uh, sometimes because he uh, himself was idealist in his all his thoughts and ideas, and we can see that from his writings. And maybe at that time he was looking for something uh, unique, beautifully, and also politically stable in the midst of uh, turmoils around him everywhere, political turmoils, wars, and oppression in every country. So that's why he was trying to bring to us the theory of the ideal place or city, and that's why it's called the just city as well. Well, absolutely. Like, you know, um, you said, it's like this system is not a brand new system. It was 
applied in several cultures before. So there was a hierarchy in ancient China and ancient Mesopotamian, ancient Egypt. And to go to your specific example, like in ancient Egypt, uh, there were even two different languages spoken simultaneously. Yes. So there are the, like, you know, the, the rulers uh, used the, the hieroglyphics, but there was the demotic language, which is the language of the commoners. And um, in some historical context, and of course, history is, you know, is always very controversial. Uh, at some periods, uh, Hebrew was spoken as well as one of the language of the commoners or the servants. Again, this is very debatable. Is this true or not? That's a different story. But there is a different hierarchy. But do you think, like, according to Plato here, he places him because he's a philosopher. <laughs> okay. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> and he said that the philosophers should be at the very top. Um, do you think that, from your own perspective, do you think that this makes sense or was this a very uh, selfish uh, point of view of Plato? Like he wants to put himself as the one on the very top of a hierarchy. I would see it actually as very prejudiced to his kind or prejudiced to his uh, group of people who think themselves they are smarter and better thinkers than others around them. But I disagree, of course, of this because philosophers, although they are great thinkers, yes, but they lack many other qualities which we need them to rule. For instance, the, the, the military uh, techniques or the military uh, trainings at that time, especially that era, Second, also, they have to have a good kind of, um, of insight in politics, real politics, not mm. one that was drawn by Plato itself. Politics, negotiations with, uh, with enemies or negotiation with other allies as well. So to be uh, on the top of hierarchy, you have to have lots of qualities that might not be present in a philosopher. So you said the philosopher is a smart person. He has like... Um he has insight, but an incomplete insight because he's, he's not good to be a statesman. So, statesman, uh, yeah. Sorry, so a statesman uh, also, as we say it in our slang language, he has to be street smart. Yeah. But philosophers are mostly academic. So to have academic person on the top of hierarchy of a regime, sometimes, of course, most of the time, is not the right uh, choice for that. Now, um, Another thing that might ring a bell, actually, um, in, in many cultures and in many countries throughout history, is the second class, which is the military. So um, he put the military, so um, according to him, he's putting the power of the mind, then the muscle, and then the instinct at the very bottom. So like it's the mind is the philosopher, the, the muscle, the will or the will or the energy is found or the people have the stamina, the, you know, to do things and yes. the momentum. They are the uh, soldiers. And then finally, we have the instinct or the basic instinct, which are the tradesmen. Uh, do you agree again with putting soldiers or the army um, on the second level of this hierarchy? Actually, this was very... Uh intriguing because he is using the military power or the armed force to put it on top of the people. So in itself, this is kind of a dictatorship or a kind of, um, how we say it, sent to suppress the people. So I believe that a military force should not be on top of any other level. It could be outside the hierarchy. Hierarchy might have the top, the rulers. In the middle, you have maybe scientists, philosophers, thinkers, and at the bottom, the normal, the majority of the people. Armed forces should be excluded out of this equation because they should be always non-prejudiced. They are always non-biased to the people. They have to protect the country from the outside and the inside. But to top, put them on top of other class of people, that definitely kind of suppression. And uh, it is always something that has been used throughout the history. Absolutely. Even even the philosophers, the, the, the great thinkers, as we think, they use the power to suppress any kind of oppressed or any kind of resistance or revolting against them as well. So is it just to say that what Plato is calling for is the, a wise dictator? 
or a wise, I wouldn't say a tyrant, but a wise despot, a wise hegemon, like someone who is very omnipotent, but he's wise, he's good. So um, he does not trust the will of the masses. He does not trust the intellect or the, the proper judgment of the masses. So Indeed. is that fair to say that he's looking for the good dictator or the... Absolutely. You're absolutely right. <laughs> he's just, he's a dictator coated with uh, sugar. Sugar okay. coated dictator. Or sometimes it's, uh, as we said again, too good to be true. So, or as, as we also say, uh, good from far, far from good. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then the third, um, you know, group that he put, the third level in society. Yeah. Uh, uh, he put in the third social class, all the tradesmen and all the workers. Uh, do you think that is fair? Like in, in, in modern times, uh, people tend to make it um, like more stratified. There's, there's, there are more uh, social classes or more structures than that. Do you agree on putting or everybody else? So, you have the philosopher king, so uh, he is a solo, he's the sole king, he's one and only. He's just unique. Under that, you have the soldiers who obsess the power, and then last is everybody else. Do you, do you think that's fair, or that's also um, a very, um, you know, like elitist? Um, um, I, I don't want to say like. Um, is there like a sort of an elitist arrogance there? Uh, yes, of course. I still agree with you on that point as well because I see it as a very radical thought mm -hmm. or a very a suppressive thought again. He does not want them to rise to the top or the middle. He wants to keep them all at the same level. Although among this level, you find lots of variants as well. Various trades, various approaches, various minds. Absolutely. You can see engineers in this level. And also you can see thieves in this level. So we cannot have them both in the same level. You have lawyers, accountants, doctors, physicians, all this in the same level with some criminals and thieves and thugs. Of course, that's unfair. So, but by doing this, you want to put everybody else in one basket. And that's against any uh, liberal thoughts or even a socially uh, positive approach. And, and do you think his analysis when he says that... Uh the soul of a philosopher is made of gold, while the souls of the soldiers is made of silver, but the souls of the commoners, the mob, the masses, is just made of either, you know, like uh, copper or, or it's made of iron. So it should be the opposite. It should be the other way around. The mass of the people are the gold. Because without the mass, there will be no society, no civilization. Those who are the farmers, the, 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 the handcraft makers, the doctors, whoever provide a service to the community or to society is the gold of the society. That's what they need to be. And again, I don't care about the other two levels, whether the silver or the gold should be, should be related to any kind of precious uh, metal. It could be just a normal without any precious description. Army, yes, it's their job to protect everybody. And they should not be differentiated by being silver or gold or diamond because it's a duty. And of course, the philosophers, again, Plato is trying to uh, distinct himself or the people like him into a different category, superior to everybody. That's why he made his soul of, made of gold. So, it's a kind um, of superiority again. How about that? Like he's stating a form of compensation by saying, okay, although we are the top, like I'm made of gold, I'm the philosopher king, and then we have this, um, you know, army or military, they, they come second, but we are not allowed to have any private property. While a compensation for the commoners who are lower in status, but they can acquire property. And and this is a form of like what we call in modern times checks and balances between the different, you know, um, so today, for example, we have the, um, you know, the um, executive power, the legislative power, the judiciary, 
and there are checks and balances between them in a democracy. So right. is, it, is, that enough, is that enough to uh, deprive the rulers and the military from acquiring um, private property? And a follow-up question for sure. Can that really happen? Like, um, is he assuming the soldiers and the rulers to be like angels? Well, that's, that's actually what you are talking about now is reflecting uh, the two extreme uh, sides of political regimes, which is socialism and capitalism. So, but he is mixing them actually in a very a weird way. Again, it's too good to be true philosophy because yes, you might deprive the military and the philosophers from acquiring property to keep them um, clean from the inside without any uh, demands or personal ambition, uh, looking for to, to accumulate wealth. Uh, but that does not, does not keep them from the idea itself of acquiring something. And that would lead to corruption. Because if he is not going to give his generals some property, then the generals might use their power to steal property from others or to steal what they don't have to own. So he is yeah. forcing them to that. And However, yeah, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, please, no, no, go. carry on, carry on, please. I'm sorry. Carry on, carry on, please continue. Yeah. No, no, okay. So I'm saying that it is not right to have such a kind of uh, approach to deprive certain class from the ownership, even though if we say if we apply this to a social society, still social society, everybody has to own something at least. At least they can own where they sleep. And in a social society, you don't have the bottom of the pyramid owns everything because this bottom of the pyramid have, again, some people might not be able to manage the wealth. Because to manage wealth, you need some educated and well-trained people to do that. So this kind of uh, distribution of wealth, according to Plato, is totally unfair and totally not logical as well. It can be logical in my opinion. Yeah, um, I see what you're trying to say here because, uh, like, what sustains a society is economy as well. So, um, like, how will uh, a philosopher king or a ruler or like the the army make ends meet? Like, how will they get, earn their bread? So uh, he might be suggesting that okay, um, the philosopher or the or the army they would get a specific wage without uh, being involved in uh, labor, they might get that wage from people in maybe in the form of taxes. Yes, taxes, of course, yes. Taxes, so like getting some taxes and, but they will not be involved in a um, like a standard uh, nine to five job um, or they, they will not be treated as serfs or peasants. But Mohammed, according to the video you have seen, it shows that uh, the middle uh, level of the hierarchy, the army and military, they are not allowed to own property. It's Absolutely. not about wages only. Yes. If it's about wages, yes, of course, they get paid from the taxes collected from the people, from the third level. But to own is something completely different. I might make lots of money as an income from you, but I might cannot own my even my own house. Mm -hmm. That's a little bit uh, contradicting here with- His argument uh, here, his argument here is that he says, in order not to blind their judgment, like he wants their judgment to be uh, free from any distortion. So then he thinks he, that ownership might distort their um, decisions. Now he is depriving a human uh, nature from expressing its will to own mm -hmm. and to be part of a group of people who might own land, uh, maybe a horse at that time, or maybe, uh, a boat, something like that. So it is again against the nature of human of mankind. Mankind, from the beginning of the civilizations, even before that, they used to own land, own their animals, own their tools to hunt with it. So the ownership is in mankind is a is like a instinct, maybe or part of their daily needs, like all their needs as well. So to deprive this group of of people in the hierarchy from owning something, that's not fair. Yeah, like there, there is, there is, uh, there are a lot of echoes there. Really, like you can, 
feel sort of an extreme uh, communist uh, um, background there, like it's, uh, yeah. he did not say, uh, you know, uh, bourgeoisie, or he did not say the proletariat, but it is like that. So the petty bourgeoisie, they're, they're, they are the owners of the, of the tools or the means of production. Yeah. And the serfs, they're like, they don't own that. So we want to uh, like cancel the private property and um, you own what you're working. So if I'm working in, the, in a factory, I'm an owner. If I work in the land, I'm an owner. And um, these ideas were later on introduced, but um, here, Plato talks about democracy. And he has such a very um, negative view of democracy because he says that... Um, like, in other words, really, he's calling for an oligarchy or a rule of the few, of the select few. There are some elites up there. And uh, because he, he's saying that democracy will never work well in, um, I, I wouldn't say an ignorant society, but uh, a society that is not fully enlightened, a society that... Um, does not have the ability to create a, um, a clear vision, like a society that is not highly educated or um, does not have profound understanding of matters of life. Uh, to what extent do you agree to that? Like, is democracy only good for some societies, but it's bad for others? You are asking a very tricky thing now, because according to my belief, no, democracy is not a dangerous thing. It's only when to introduce it. It's only a time. When are you going to introduce democracy and how it would work? But I do agree with him partially one thing, that democracy should not be given to, I wouldn't say illiterate people, but people who have no experience with democracy or freedom. So we have to introduce it slowly. You cannot give them every think at the full time. Like a child, you cannot teach him something from high school at the age of five or six. So in a gradual sense, you would not... Gradual sense, yes. Mm -hmm. You have to train them. But in order to do so, you have to have a regime or a government that is really keen to transfer its society from being uh, ignorant about democracy to a democratic level without uh, abusing uh, their life, without being dictators. So it has to be very true honest government. Very... Will this ever happen? Like, uh, in reality, will this ever happen? <laughs> well, it, it, uh, happened in some, it happened in some places, yes. Mm -hmm. I would say that the north, uh, western, northern, uh, northwest European countries, uh, excluding... So Scandinavia, Europe, like in Scandinavia. Scandinavians mainly, yes. They have achieved this uh, equation. And actually, they, ha they will be envied for that because they have crossed all the lines of theories of, uh, of the, this uh, dilemma of not how to apply the democracy right. They did it. And they did it in a social environment as well. And there are still no illiteracy there. And uh, no literacy mean and no uh, dictatorship for a long time since the World War II. They, they have succeeded in that. But if we go back again to Plato uh, for a second, uh, well, Plato, when he... Uh, wants to say that democracy is not uh, for the normal, for the people, that's true. That's not true, so I'm sorry, that's wrong. That cannot be that, because we have to introduce it slowly. And I would like to mention to you a very small story that uh, I have heard that happened in China in the 70s, where, uh, where my father was there visiting at that time. And uh, he, they took him to a theater, opera theater in Beijing. When he entered the theater, he found that the seats are made of wood. Very hard and very uh, uncomfortable seats. So my father asked them the question, how come you have such an opera house with great musicians and singers, but yet you have the people sitting on wooden chairs? So the answer was as follows. They have to be grateful first that they have a theater to attend, and slowly we will introduce to them the comfortable seats. So we cannot take them from no art at all to a very comfortable environment. Whether we agree or disagree with this theory, but yet everything has to be introduced slowly. So the human mind 
can accept it and can use it for its, ben its future, its uh, benefits. Because here Plato argues that, um, you know, people would, um, in a democracy, uh, it would result in chaos. Uh, like there would be loss of control of everything. And uh, eventually, people would resort to dictatorship to uh, run away from. So he says, like, there is, like, oligarchy or, like, uh, the, ro the rule of the nobles, let's say. And then um, people might revolt against it. So resulting in uh, a democracy, but democracy is chaos. There is no discipline at all, and then they would resort finally to um, dictatorship. And but uh, from history, really, again, it is extremely rare that anyone would willingly give up power. Yes, you know, like, and and that is why it it is quite impossible with the exception of very few cases. And actually, exceptions assert and confirm the, you know, the correctness of a rule. So the rule is no one gives power willingly. It, for you to have democracy and freedom, you have to snatch it. You have to fight for it. If it happened in like, countries in like, Scandinavian countries, well, that's an anomaly. That's an enigma. That's something out of the usual. Out of the norm, yes. Out so, of the norm, exactly. Uh, but normally, no one will give up power. Absolutely. So, so uh, which means that if we want to wait until people are educated enough, which is something that dictators will never do. Dictators would never, ever educate the, the people, would never um, empower the people, would never enrich the people. So, like, there is the, like, you know, the evil triangle of ignorance, of, of you know, disease, and, um, and of, poverty. Seven of poverty. These are the three things that always a dictator would try and do. So, if we want to wait for people to be enlightened, informed, for people to live, uh, you know, because for you to think about things, you must have you know, uh, leisure time. And to get leisure time, you must have a good economy and so on. So it's a very vicious circle, very vicious cycle here. Um, so if we wait for these prerequisites, for people to be educated, have good health, have good economy, we'll just wait forever. Um, that's, what, that's why I said at the beginning of the, when you asked me about this, I said it has to be, it, has, it requires a very fair, and unprejudiced government or regime. It has, it requires the extreme uh, democracy from the government itself or the extreme care about its people. But my question is, but will this, is this not... ever come? Like it's, it's like the chicken or the egg, you know? Yes. <laughs> For you to have democracy, you need people to be like educated, prepared, understanding things, yes. uh, ready in a gradual manner. But again, for you to have people to be well-educated, to be well-off, you need a democracy. So, uh, which but, comes before the other? No, but first of all, I, I will ask you something, Mohammed. now. Are you saying that this is impossible? Because you are putting an obstacle here, right? Um, from my understanding, I would, I would yeah. say like history tells us that um, democracy is never given. Like, it okay. never ever happens. It does happen, but again, in very rare occasions. Like, it well, happens yeah. rarely. But the norm, the usual thing is that dictators or people in power would never ever give up the power unless they are forced to, unless they're toppled. Or we can put it in a different form. Let's say that democracy is achievable, yes, but after, lot, after lots of bloodshed and dictatorship. So a society has to pass through lots of ordeals in, in suppression, dictatorship, uh, discrimination, until they reach this level of democracy. That means no. it is attainable, yes, but it has a price and a hefty price. And we can see this in the French Revolution, for instance. Yeah. The French Revolution since start in, in, in 1793, it until the last monarchy in 1870s, 100 years, 
they have seen six republics and six monarchies between. So it was monarchy, republic, monarchy, republic. And between, lots of bloodshed, lots of dictatorship. An emperor thinks he owns France and its people. Then Absolutely. comes a republic who would kill all those who are following the emperor. So, yes. But you know, the French, the French example here. So like, uh, people revolted against the, the king and queen who are like extreme, uh, like uh, dictators, extreme uh, tyrants and living um, in a different planet altogether, really not feeling anything of the masses, uh, favoring the nobles, etc., etc. And then they'd lost their heads with a guillotine. They had their heads cut off. And, um, but, but the fuel of the uh, revolution, again, came from people like uh, Victor Hugo, for example, like uh, some French writers. So uh, the story of Les Miserables, for example, is yes. one of the stories that triggered... Um, Les Miserables, uh, the Hunchback yeah. of Notre Dame, even. Exactly. Exactly. Yes, all, the, all these yes, novels and plays, they gave the first uh, ideas about uh, revolting against uh, the dictatorship of a monarchy. Exactly. So again, so here you can say that you had a philosopher fueling it, fueling democracy. So, but, uh, but those who, took, who revolted and achieved the revolution, they themselves killed each other. Absolutely. Absolutely. Those, and then we had the Napoleon. And they were very intellectual, by the way. Yeah. Mirabeau and, and uh, Romara, they were all uh, journalists, writers, poets, and they killed each other, <laughs> which is very ironic, actually. But this confirms what you said earlier, that once you are in power, it's very hard to give it up. And you might tend to get rid or eliminate all your peers who might contradict you one day and tell you you're wrong. And that's what they did. Okay, so, so maybe Prit was right. <laughs> last but not least, here, yes. um, um, how can we ref like, um, how can we, re you know, um, see any resemblance or reflect this on the modern times? So, um, since the 19, um, you know, like since the middle of the 20th century, uh, we have seen many revolutions and so on and so forth, but. Um, since the middle of the 20th century, there was a, like a very big tide of revolutions and, and calls for freedom, independence, in, yeah. independence exactly, and the third world, like getting rid of the imperialism and um, so on and so forth. We've seen these happen in, in uh, Latin America. We've seen it happen in Africa and Asia, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And uh, then later on, we see, we've seen revolutions against regimes. So uh, there was like people who wanted to kick out the invaders or imperialism from foreign powers. But we witnessed a lot of coup d'etats as well. We witnessed a lot of regimes being toppled. Um, that, like, for instance, in, like in the, we've seen... Uh, in 1979, uh, like the Shah uh, being uh, toppled, and then the the uh, you know the um, uh, Ayatollahs took power in in Iran. We've seen in the 1990s um, with the fall of the Wall of Berlin, when uh, uh, the President Reagan called on Mikhail Gorbachev and told him, "Mr. Gorbachev, please bring down that wall." And then um, we had a big tide of, you know, changes in, in, in Europe. We've seen someone like Nicolae Ceausescu, uh, the Romanian dictator, disappear. He was removed, exactly. and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And then very recently, in the last decade, we've seen a lot of things like that in the Middle East. To what extent do you see any... Do you see any resemblance at all between what happened in the, in the 50s of the 20th century until the first decade of the 21st century? Is there any connection between what Plato's saying and what really happened? First, we have to look at it from a different uh, view. First of all, we would say that it's all humans connected, human behavior connected. Humans are humans. 
through the history. And whatever they w did 3,000 years or 2,000 years ago, they are still doing it, but in a different form. So Plato was afraid, or he maybe have seen the future. He was afraid that once you give some democracy to the people, they might abuse it and create chaos. But the same thing is the opposite. I mean, sorry, the opposite is that what if you give them the stability, but within a very uh, corrupted regime and that lasts for a long time? And I will, I will go and put some emphasis on the Middle Eastern countries and especially the Arab Spring. Those systems that have fallen during the Arab Spring were against a regime that lasted for 30, 40 years. And of course, in any kind of modern democracy, if we call it democracy, it's not right to have a regime which is called a republic, not a monarchy, to last for this such long time. Because when you stay in the regime for such a long time, everything gets rotten. I'm, I'm using this word because, yeah, it's, it's an old, rotten, and um, no modernization, no new blood to change and or to cope with the changes that happens around in the world. So people would reach a certain point, they have to revolt against it. Especially with the, the, the it's again, people are not children. The, the, the public are not children. They, they, you cannot give them such a, a, a speech uh, uh, and then tell them to listen to it like a child. At a certain point, they realize that what you give them is not the right thing. They need more and more education, healthcare. They need more modernization in their life and jobs. But if you don't give them any of these, they must revolt. They must say, stop it now. Your regime is obsolete. You have to get out and we will get a new one, a new system that would think better. Although, even though they, they revolted, but they didn't bring this uh, dream regime or dream president. They brought another <laughs> systems that might not achieve anything for them as well. Or so, maybe they so, brought radical systems. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt here, but so you're seeing, you're, you're sort of seeing eye to eye with, with, with Plato here because those people were ruled by uh, a dictatorship uh, or tyranny uh, that sort of lingered they just lingered in power and they stayed like it seemed like an infinite rule, really. And it transformed from a republic that's supposed to, you know, you're supposed to rule for like one period or two periods with a maximum of 10 years, maybe. But some of them stayed for 30 or 40 years and inheritance was in the picture. So it's not only me, it will be my son as well. After it was again uh, pouring uh, some fuel on the fire. Absolutely. And in many cases, the, the children of the president were the de facto rulers, really. They were the actual ruler, rulers. Like, they did not have the title, but they were the de facto rural, rulers. And they were eventually going to become the real rulers of the country. So people were sick and tired of this, of uh, unfair treatment and so on. And they went to revolt. They took to the streets and revolted and they toppled. Uh, but what many people would argue, they only toppled the head of the regime and not the regime. The regime was still there. So, and, and um, that is why uh, maybe again, like something like the French Revolution, which eventually succeeded after a lot of bloodshed, after a lot of atrocities, after a lot of chaos, but eventually it succeeded in giving the world one of its leading democracies. Um, after 100 years. Part, yeah, exactly. And, 100, and, years. And 100 years. Even in North America, like, you know, uh, countries like, um, you know, um, um, United States and Canada, um, again, France was always seen as a role model yes. of, of democracy. So, um, I, I, so maybe the French Revolution, many people would, at, would argue that um, getting rid of the king is only the tip of the iceberg. You just got rid of the tip of the iceberg, but uh, you really have to go deeper into the crypts of the state. And this takes a very lengthy uh, 
it's a very lengthy and a very hard process. So, uh, so what, yeah. So, yeah. So for, for a system to last for 30 or 40 years, it has to have very, very rooted in the ground foundations in order to survive all that time without any shaking or any this instability, they have, they are into the, the octopus in every corner of the society or the country, they have their arms rooted in it. So, as you said, if you cut only the head of the iceberg or the, the head of the top of the mountain, but the roots are there, and maybe they will hibernate for a little bit of time and they will come to the surface again, they will use new names, new slogans and maybe new faces to introduce but still the old regime will be there as well which focus only on the benefit of its members and it's not a regime that would look after the benefit of the whole society or to sacrifice for them they only focus on how to increase and build their wealth again so eventually and, they might succeed but it takes a long time it will take a long time and as we said if it took the french revolution 100 years to stabilize and give the world the model of a revolution against monarchies. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how it long it will take in Middle Eastern countries. It might take another 20 years, 30 years, and it might not happen at all. Because, you know, the French Revolution, again, was, was uh, a major uh, factor that induced, really, the creation of what is known today as constitutional monarchies. Because most of the monarchs of Europe were afraid of fa facing the same destiny as the French king and queen. So they said, you know what? Okay, okay, okay. You know what? I, I will I will own but not rule. Like, you know, uh, I'll be just a symbol but uh, and we'll create a constitutional monarchy. Um, here, um, in Plato's, just to finish off here, but it's a very important point, really. He talked about in his um, ideal republic, um, and he calls it a republic, but it has a king. <laughs> That's the interesting part. So he calls it a republic. He calls his, his state a republic, but it has a philosopher king. Which is the constitutional monarchy is now, as exactly. we know. It. Exactly. But, so, uh, but, I but in a constitutional monarchy, the king does not rule. The prime minister would be the, the one who takes care of the policies. The king or queen are just a symbol. Yes. Or but a chancellor. Or, yes. but, so he's... He's actually mixing many, many different things together, like a bit of this, a bit of that. Uh, but he says in his republic, there is a very rigorous uh, educational system that is based on merit and not on inheritance. So whoever is worthy of being educated, they will get the maximum that they deserve, um, but it's not based on inheritance. So. It's not good enough that your father was a genius for you to be a genius. No, these things are not inherited. And if your father was just a layman, um, you can still be a genius. And to what, to what extent is this ID useful? Okay. And actually, you got to the best part of what we have seen earlier. Because I have learned this one thing from Plato's theory of Republic and all what he talked about, the only positive thing I see, and I would apply it through, all the, through the history, is that education has to be given to those who would need it or want it and are capable to handle it and grow up with it. So what he said about this, that it's not a merit for the, the, the royals or whatever connected to the higher hierarchy, but for those who deserve it and those who would be able to carry it and go further with it. So 100% Plato in that part, he was a philosopher, a real philosopher. That's what makes him a philosopher, education, and who deserves it. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And um, although we came to the end here, but I really want to thank you very much for being with, with, uh, with us tonight. Amen. Thank you, and, it's, it's been a pleasure and uh, really looking forward to having you many times again in this program. Thank you. It is uh, always a pleasure to be with you, Muhammad, and uh, to share with you this great knowledge and to learn from you as well. Uh, lots of uh, new things and we can exchange ideas all 
for the benefit yeah. of everybody, so everybody can I'm, learn I'm, from that. I'm extremely humbled by your your like your words, but uh, it's it's always a mutual benefit, and and oh, we course, all yeah. learn from each other. Um, and the only thing uh, I that I believe in so much is that knowledge, whatever you have it, I have it. It's not uh, our possession; it belongs to everybody. Absolutely, absolutely, I totally agree. And uh, dear viewers, just to conclude here, um, you know, Plato was talking to us um, in the first episode. We talked about the different levels of um, being or the different levels of existence. And uh, today he talked, uh, we talked about the different levels of government. But definitely, um, if we would come up with something or come out with something here is again um really it's education it's education because um you can see as much as you know i will not be concerned with something i don't know and uh, humans are always the enemies of the unknown we always hate things that we do not know and uh, that's why we hate darkness. Darkness itself is not bad because we want darkness to sleep. We enjoy darkness to sleep and, and gives us sort of serenity. But uh, the real reason we hate darkness is that we cannot know where we're going. We are unaware. Un so a person who does, is not well enlightened is also a very fertile ground for um, being brainwashed for um, all sorts of terrorism, all sorts of, of prejudice, all sorts of bigotry, all sorts of stigma. So um, education, really, education is the key. And um, a dictator will never succeed in an educated society. And that's why always a dictator would make sure that his public are ignorant as much as possible. Ignorance makes you very easy to be ruled. Ignorance would make you have a weak, weak health. Ignorance will usually make you poor with few exceptions. So the key to dictatorship is ignorance. The key to freedom and successful freedom and liberty is education. So let's really watch out for this and let's take good care of education and enlightenment. At the end, dear viewers, thank you very much for being with us as usual. Until we meet next time, take good care.